Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. If you're interested in these programs, please join our membership. You can join by going to preservelincoln.org. Um, today is the 13th of a series of lectures with Jim McKee. Um, support for this series is provided by Speedway Properties. Please join me in thanking Speedway Properties for their generous support of the videotaping and other expenses associated with this series. Our speaker today is Jim McKee. Jim is a lifelong Lincolnite. His great-grandparents pioneered in Lancaster County in the 1870s. He has a bachelor's degree from UNL and operates J and L Lee Company, publisher of regional books. He has written over 1,000 articles and books on Lincoln and Nebraska history. Jim is on the Nebraska State Historical Society Board of Trustees and also serves on the Lincoln, the City of Lincoln Pre Historic Preservation Commission. And he's also a founding member for the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Um, this is the 13th of a series of over 25 talks during the next couple of years. The series is titled Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln, and this is program number 13. Jim invites you to ask questions during the program. Please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. Well, we pick up probably in the uh, 1870s, so we're really moving right along, aren't we? This is an advertisement for the American Agriculturist, which is, I think, 1873. Uh, what we're doing here is selling the land that the railroads receive primarily from the federal government to build the railroad. And of course, the land itself, they only used a very tiny portion of the huge grants that they got, and we'll be talking about those grants a little bit later on. Uh, but they used only a tiny portion of it for the railroad to go through. What they had to do was then sell that land that they were given for cash in order to build the railroad. And it looks, in, in looking back, it looks like these millions of acres of land just in Nebraska would have been far in excess of what they needed to build the railroad, but in fact, not true. Uh, the Burlington is even going to undergo bankruptcy in there. So it really got expensive when they got to the mountains. Laying it across the plains was not much. They needed to sell an awful lot of land very quickly. This uh, particular advertisement is at a point in time where Nebraska has just suffered not only an economic depression, but also an infestation of, agri of uh, excuse me, grasshoppers. So the guy that wrote the advertising copy for this piece had his work cut out for him. A lot of people who have already bought land from the railroad um, or have come out other ways have lost the land and are heading back uh, east primarily. So he had a tough road. So the advertisement primarily says, uh, you have 10 years to pay, uh, that they will loan you the money at 6% interest to buy the land, that you make no principal payment till the fourth year, you can get a 20% discount if you pay cash, you can get a 20% discount if you put improvements on the land immediately, you can get a 20% discount if you cultivate the land immediately, you can get a 20% discount if you buy on short credit, uh, so it sounds like the land was free. It actually doesn't work that way because you can't add 20% to 20%. It's of the remaining amount, but it still was a heck of a deal. They also offered, uh, through the federal government, they were allowed to give uh, transportation rights so that if you came from, let's say, Indiana and bought land from the Burlington in Nebraska, uh, you could receive from them a discount on the fare to come out after you had bought the land. Uh, in some cases, if you bought enough land or bought it in the right place, you could get free transportation out. Uh, the other thing they offered was a sort of, if you remember when they built Tuttle, Tuttle Creek Dam, uh, you could go down and look at the land that they were trying to sell you. They would give you a gasoline allowance. They would put you up overnight in the hotel. They would give you a free Timex watch. In one case, all you had to do is listen to their sales pitch. So the Burlington offered the same sort of thing, where they would bring people back on, or to Nebraska on excursions uh, free of charge. Uh, about half of the people who came on those excursions were told bought land. Then if you did buy land, uh, through the federal government's uh, waivers, and they control the rates of uh, railroad tickets and so forth, uh, you could get 
a, for example, up to a free railroad car. So leaving again from Indiana, you could pack into that railroad car your family's possessions, uh, your furniture, your livestock, and your family, and bring it out to various places in Nebraska, starting first with an immigrant house in Omaha. Later, they move further west, an immigrant house in Lincoln. Uh, later, the other railroads will have them scattered along. For example, there was one at um, uh, Henderson, Nebraska, on another railroad, where they would bring you out with this car, uh, free of charge. Uh, so, a great deal, and the advertising message in here says that the, ad, the grasshoppers did visit. They carried away the corn and wrecked havoc. However, now talking about the people who had already bought land here, their want of courage offers the best possible opportunity for buying land from the Burlington. In other words, they got out, so that leaves an excellent opportunity. Well, it's hard to look at it that way, I think. Uh, and you will be able to buy some of the finest lands at bottom prices. Now is the time to come secure good bargains. Uh, most of the land they were selling, seven or eight dollars an acre. Some of it went up to as high as eighteen dollars an acre. Uh, ultimately, in Lincoln, when they moved the land office here, the building which we'll see in just a second, in one day, averaging about eight, ten dollars an acre. In one day in Lincoln in 1875, they sold ten thousand dollars worth of land. So. Uh, it did work, and it did work, obviously, because they were able to build a railroad. This is uh, looking at the land office, which they moved up from Nebraska City just uh, the previous year. We're standing on top of, think of standing on top of the Centrum building on the southwest corner of 12th and O Street and looking towards the southwest. The board fence on the left in the picture uh, is actually along O Street. So we're looking at an angle towards the southwest the white frame two-story building is the U.S. Land Office, uh, which was on 11th Street. Uh, right across the street from it was the livery stable of Bohannon Brothers. And it appears in this picture that 11th Street is a bridge. That's because in this picture, 11th Street is a bridge. Uh, this is a stream or an arroyo, a dry creek bed, which we'll, we'll call an arroyo, which uh, had its headwaters uh, and today where Noodles restaurant is on which would be 14th and P streets and below that building uh, was an artesian well with a supposed four inch head of water uh, from that well water flowed towards the southwest through the current Wells Fargo buildings property uh, crossed O Street at a diagonal at a 12th Street you following this John uh, and then went a half a block into that block where it ran directly to the west and emptied into Salt Creek. Uh, now, when they, in the 1960s, when they redid some of the um, culverts under the city, they discovered that that four inch head of water, though probably not pumping that much water at the time, was still pumping water. Uh, and it emptied into a culvert, which I think. Matt, your father gave me a picture of, which is a brick culvert about five feet tall, an arch top with side walls, which at that time they were still using. Uh, water was still running through there, so in order to build new coverage, they had to take the water around each time they moved it and dump it into that same area. The uh, clean laundry, somebody obviously lived along O Street at there at that point in time. Uh, what we're looking at is from the top of another building, which really is what we want to talk about at this point in time, and that is Halo's Opera House, which was built on that corner. Uh, to go back in the story, a man by the name of Ed Church came to the city of Lincoln from Illinois, uh, living on the north side of T Street between 8th and 9th, and he produced the first play uh, in the city of Lincoln, and he put it on, as it sounds like this might, might happen today, but he put it on in the Capitol building about 1869. We don't think of the Capitol building as a place where plays might be uh, put on today. Uh, however, it being the largest gathering place in the city, we find churches meeting in there and everything else in that original Capitol building, so not too unusual. Uh, Mr. Halo arrived at the same time, 1869, from St. Joseph, Missouri. And he has a, a Halo's Opera House in Missouri at that time. Comes with his attorney, and they purchase, the two of them, uh, Mr. Halo and A.L. Palmer, they buy the lands on the southwest corner of 12th and O. 
Uh, they then hired a St. Joseph architect and builder by the name of Mr. Eckel to design a new opera house on the property. And by 1872, the basement for this building we see has been completed. Uh, spring of the following year, uh, the masonry walls go up and a cast iron front is put on so that Halo's Opera House, as we see it here, was opened on October the 6th of 1872. I don't have a photograph of Halo's. This is on a letterhead, which I have, which shows Halo's Opera House. The building is described variously as three stories plus basement, 75 feet on the O Street French by 90 feet with a mansard roof. Uh, looks like the right building. Then it says there were three cellars in the building. And I'd have to look to my architect friends to find out what that means. But apparently three separate rooms in the basement of the building were called separate cellars. I don't know. Uh, there was also a restaurant in this building. Uh, on the main floor, of course, were retail establishments. We've talked about that. They quite frequently did this to have income for the opera house, which might operate one or two or three nights a week. But by having retail businesses on the ground floor, um, they could get income during the uh, entire week. Then the theater was on the top two floors. And as usual, you would enter in the center, go upstairs uh, to the second floor where the ticket office, dressing rooms, and offices were, as well as the 800-seat auditorium. So a pretty good-sized auditorium for a building of this side. Uh, also, the third floor had on the O Street side four small offices facing outwards toward O Street, towards the north, and also the upper level of the horseshoe-shaped balcony, which set above the auditorium. Uh, the stage then was on the south end or the alley end of the building uh, and it was 45 by 55 feet uh, and it, various estimates on the cost of building the building were between 30 and 40 thousand dollars so not very specific that's a pretty wide range of, of uh, monies. The manager of the opera house was Ed Church the same guy who put on that first play uh, over in the Capitol building. His day job was he had a paint and wallpaper store on O Street directly across the street from the theater. Uh, Halos, it was said uh, in a newspaper article, was the most popular opera house in Lincoln until Kate Claxon, who I like this, assisted in the burning of so many theaters, <laughs> was playing the play Two Orphans. When the theater was destroyed by fire, October the 4th of 1875, so it was about two years old, uh, and the building burned to the ground. The cause of the fire was listed in the paper variously as being due to a candle flame in the footlights or gas lights somehow which ignited the curtain. At any rate, we do know the building, uh, which was uninsured, was completely destroyed. And we have this picture again, thanks to Matt, who I think found it on eBay and it was misidentified, uh, which makes it a bargain usually. But by looking carefully at this, uh, I think Matt showed me the picture and I said, you know, I think I do know what building that was and we're able to uh, take from the shapes of some of those windows and so forth, it is the, actually the burning of the Halo's Opera House. So we ended up with a picture of it quite almost by accident. Then May of 1876, the new Opera House opened on the same site. And this is a rather famous picture used quite a bit. And, and looking at the picture, we can see that now the sidewalk just to the west of the building is on stilts. That's because that creek bed, Arroyo, is running across O Street at a diagonal under what is firmly the Burr Block, uh, goes by the building and dumps into that Arroyo, which we saw goes directly west into Salt Creek. Uh, named, because it was completed in 1876, named the Centennial Opera House. And if you look carefully, you can see it written above the uh, top middle window on the top of the third floor. Uh, we don't know, but it's probable that they used part of the foundations of the Halo Opera House if they were good enough. This is very common, and you'd use part of the foundations. And one of the reasons that later on that they'll do that is because they can get a, instead of a building permit, they can get a remodeling permit. Uh, sometimes they just use it as an economy because the foundation walls was good. Uh, on September the 7th of 1878, so two years later, uh, the newspaper again notes that a phonograph was exhibited at the Opera House for the first time. So it kind of sets the stage of what we're talking about in terms of time here. Again, we have the first floor with two offices on it, which will bring in rent. Again, the auditorium is on the upper two floors. In 1873, a man by the name of Otto Funk, F-U-N-K-E, was operating a wholesale liquor and cigar business in Lincoln. 
Uh, and at this point in time, shortly after this picture is taken, it's Otto's son, Fred Funk, becomes the manager of the Opera House. Then in 1885, the name of the Opera House was changed to the Funk Opera House, although it still reads as Centennial above the window. And at that point in time, this building is extended to the south to the alley to accommodate a larger stage. Uh, another character enters the picture at this time, a man by the name of uh, Frank Connell Zerung. He graduated from Lincoln High School in 1876, the University of Nebraska a couple of years later, and then he opened a drugstore on O Street. Uh, and by 1894, he was also listed as the manager uh, and lessee of the Funk Opera House. Uh, he also was the manager and lessee of the Lansing Opera House, which was on the southwest corner of 13th and P Streets. We're going to look at that some months from now and, and remember it as the Varsity Theater site. Um, some of you will remember that. Mr. Zerung was also elected the mayor of the city of Lincoln in 1913 and uh, after dropping out again in 1921. So he served two terms as mayor. And he built an op a uh, townhouse directly west of the uh, Lansing Liberty Varsity Theater, uh, which we'll also see later. And he established what was known then as the Zerung uh, Advertising Company, which was an outdoor billboard company. Uh, around the turn of the century, the first motion pictures in Lincoln were noted at being screened in the Funk Theater building. We think that probably the first motion picture theater screening in the area was at the far economically advanced area of Havelock, very naturally. Uh, and they were shown outdoors on a, sh on a screen beside the building. Uh, but at any rate, it then the the newspaper article goes on to say that after the first motion pictures were screened at the Funk, the theater burned three more times and was at that point rebuilt as the Funk office building. It's hard to understand how some of these theaters could continue to get insurance because they seem to burn down with great regularity. Uh, we know that the first one burned down an uninsured, Halos, uh, and in fact when it was rebuilt the city of Lincoln uh, the city remitted taxes for the first year, uh, maybe even the first two years, because they thought an opera house was a necessity to have a metropolitan city. Uh, you, you went from becoming just a dusty hamlet to a city when you had an opera house. So uh, they also got subscriptions from people to help build the building. Here we see the Centennial with its uh, addition on the south end back end stage, and we also see that perhaps the insurance company has instructed them to put on fire escapes on the building as well. Uh, so this is the centennial, which will be after uh, yet another very profitable fire, uh, replaced with this building, uh, which becomes the Funk Office Building. Um, in 1918, uh, one of the tenants down of the block, down a couple of ways to the west, was the Kresge's 5 and 10 cent store, which was 1127 O Street. Then in 1926, they moved into this building, and you can see there on a corner on the ground floor, there's also a men's uh, clothing store in there. Uh, then in 1940, this building was shown as empty, and later in 1940, it was torn down, and S.S. Kresge building uh, was built on the site. And here again, we don't know. It's possible that they again used some of the foundation walls from the Funk office building or the Funk theater building, uh, and maybe even going back as far as the Halo Opera House. Have no way of knowing. Uh, it just sometimes happened. Now, this corner, of course, is where the uh, Centrum, Lincoln's downtown department store, uh, shopping center, is located. And if you can go in there and buy anything but a Coke, I'd be surprised. But right on that corner where the Opera House was, there's an open area, kind of a plaza with a kinetic sculpture in it. Of course, we're looking down O Street here, probably in the early 1960s, something like that. Uh, this photograph is taken from the roof of the Burr block, so we're looking, we're standing on the northeast corner of 12th and O, looking over uh, the block, which I will think of as the Miller and Payne, Reg and Gunzel block. McGee's sits on this block right here, looking towards the Capitol building, uh, and we see there uh, several things. The second state Capitol building, which has replaced now the first Capitol building. Uh, we can see a lot of church spires still. Uh, on the first one on the right would be the First Presbyterian Church. Directly behind it to the south would be First Congregational Church. Um, the church which intercedes before the 
Capitol building without a tall spire, at least we can't see one, is uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, we can look beyond it and see the First Baptist Church and possibly uh, the Christian Church. The Capitol building, of course, the first one began to disintegrate, disintegrate within a couple of years, even months after it was completed. Uh, and in 1879, uh, the state appropriated $75,000 for the west wing of the second Capitol building. And it's going to be built the same way our present Capitol building was built in a way. They're going to build a section, another section, but they'll leave the little Capitol building in the middle to be torn down and the center section built as a third stage, kind of like uh, the Capitol building is today. And I'm very surprised that we don't have more pictures of that construction. I would think someone would have taken pictures showing the first structure and the little building still in there, but, but I have not seen them. So somebody, Matt's going to find them someday, and we'll have those pictures, but they, they just have to be out there. So 1879 appropriates $75,000 for the West Wing. The contractor will be W.H.B. Stout, a man with far too many initials. Uh, 1881, the West Wing will be completed. Uh, at a little cost of a little over $83,000. Uh, naturally, we're going to run over a little bit. Uh, 1882, the other wing, the east wing, will be $108,000. Then in 1888, we will tear down the little old Capitol building and build up the new one. Uh, and that center section, which of course is far more elaborate, will cost $439,187, bringing the total cost of the second Capitol building that we see here. Uh, at $691,428.80. And there it is. We're looking towards the southwest, standing on the corner of the block, uh, a much photographed building. Uh, the central section, at least, was uh, designed by William Wilcox. I don't know whether other architects were involved. I'm looking at Ed, I'm looking at Matt, I'm looking at Tom, but I don't know whether other architects were involved in the other part, but apparently Wilcox was overall. Now we have some mysterious pictures, uh, and here again I look to, to others to maybe correct me a little bit. We know who this is, certainly. This is the office of the governor, who was James Dawes. He was the governor between 1883 and 1887. Uh, he would be the uncle of Charles Dawes, who came to Lincoln. You, uh, you're shaking your head no, so I presume that that means... <laughs> I've never seen this. You've never seen this picture before, okay. That was the, I thought you were shaking your head. No, that no, you're wrong again, Mickey. <laughs> okay, uh, an interesting picture. We can tell because they've very cleverly opened the door to the governor's office so that you can re read the sign on, on it, and that, that's what helps us identify it. Um, and we can see that Governor Dawes has uh, probably got just gas lights, maybe electric lights and gas lights, as we talked about last time, uh, and they've lined up. Who knows who with the governor uh, to see his office? And he has great taste in, in floor coverings. You know this one, Matt? This, this picture is the uh, Attorney General's office, Isaac Powers, uh, probably at about the same time. And we can read his door again, clearly. Uh, he's got only gas lights, <laughs> for sure. Uh, he does have great taste in carpet. And he's got a great cast iron bookcase which revolves. I don't know where I'd put it, but I ought to have one of those, I think. And he's got a dictionary stand. Uh, and also, he has the obligatory brass spittoon. Now, the governor had what appeared to be brass. This appears more like maybe cast iron. But every office in the Capitol building would have had at least one spittoon at that time. I don't have very many pictures of the interior. and. I think this is a picture of the second Capitol building's uh, legislative chamber. I don't know what else it would be because it's too big to be the first one. Uh, it's an interesting picture in that, first of all, it's disintegrating a little bit, but secondarily there are some things in this picture which just didn't happen at that time, except on one day of the session. And that was, if we look closely, we can see not only are there children in the picture, but ye gads, there are women in the picture. Now, they were allowed in the legislative chamber only on the opening day. Uh, and I think even in the present Capitol building, that was a, sort of the standard. You brought your family in on the opening day. Um, so don't know much about the picture. It's just interesting, and we couldn't, we couldn't not put it in. The other thing which came about uh, in the second Capitol building, uh, not in, within the building, but which uh, 
is maintained in the second Capitol building. And there's not much left of the second Capitol building. Uh, so far as I know, we have the black and white tiles in the four courtyards, which were brought from the second building. And I know this uh, comes from the second building. And we know a lot of those interior tiles went out to the state men's reformatory. But other than that, we really don't have much left of the second building, unless you know of some things that I don't know. And I'm cornerstone. The cornerstone. So yeah, we have the cornerstone. I think we see a picture of that in a second. The Lincoln statue comes about when, uh, right after the Civil War, the Grand Army of the Republic suggested that Lincoln have a statue of Lincoln and that an appropriate place for it would be on the University of Nebraska campus. As often happens, nothing happened. Uh, in 1895, a stonecutter who probably worked for one of the monument companies, his name was John Curry, C-U-R-R-I-E. Uh, he promoted himself as a sculptor uh, and he began working in the front window of Mayer Brothers Clothing Store, which was on O Street at that time, to put together kind of, uh, not a maquette, but a plaster cast of what he proposed as a Lincoln statue. Uh, the, ca the statue he saw it also as part of a fountain and a art artesian well, not very specifically located. Uh, he then solicited and received from the state of Tennessee two huge blocks of marble, uh, which were moved to the Capitol grounds. And I guess he was going to set up a marble carving studio right on the Capitol grounds. Uh, and in fact, it said he started hammering away on this marble. But apparently, he was not a true sculptor. He was more like the guy who would do inscriptions on marble. And that's what makes me think he might have worked for a monument company. Do we know Mr. Curry at all, Ed or Matt or Tom? Uh, I don't know anything about him, but I think he must have probably worked for one of the monument companies. At any rate, nothing comes of it. Uh, the two huge pieces of marble get chipped away, apparently never bearing any resemblance to Abraham Lincoln. And I'm guessing that sometime or another the park department ended up with them. I've always thought that someday we'll find these pieces of marble sitting around and wonder what the heck they are. Could be remnants of that, we really don't know. But in 1903, a memorial association was formed. Uh, and they set up with the state a $10,000 challenge grant. Uh, by 1908, not too much had happened, and they uh, asked Mr. F.M. Hall, the attorney, uh, who will later give a lot of the artwork that res resides now in Sheldon and is the property of the Nebraska Art Association, uh, appointed him chairman to raise the money. Uh, in 1909, they managed to get together and agree that the new statue would be designed and completed by Daniel Chester French. Um, a, a contract was issued with him. They saw it at that time that, or they figured at that time, that most of the money would come from donations. A lot of it they thought would get a nickel and a dime at a time from the school children of Nebraska. Uh, the state of Nebraska was willing to underwrite part of it, but it really didn't come about. The financing didn't come about as they expected at all, and the nickels and dimes that came from the school children across the state probably amounted to only hundreds, maybe a few thousands of dollars. Uh, so at any rate, the, the, the statue is dedicated. Mr. French is never paid completely because it turns out that they don't have the money. Uh, and Mr. French comes up and offers an, uh, a sort of an agreement with them that he will forgive whatever the balance was that they owed if he will be allowed to make 12 scale models. And I think they stand, I've seen them, they stand about four and a half, five feet tall, something like that. There's one uh, at the Chicago Institute of Art in Chicago, uh, and it, you can see instantly that this, this is this, st this statue, sort of a maquette, but on a smaller uh, version of this one. Uh, so 1912, this one is set, and of course it still remains on that west side of the Capitol building as one of the things which comes forward from the second building, not actually a part of the building. And I thought, but we don't have in here, I thought we had a picture of the two cornerstones together. Uh, they're, they're well, well... May, yes, Tom? Make a little quick note to Please. What, what remains of the second building. Okay, Tom is, uh, is going to tell us some of the things as a footnote which remain, and I have to repeat it for if you wonder what's going on of the second building. That's right. I have to, uh, Tom points out that Lincoln Parks and Rec has some columns. They're sort of faux columns, as I recall, flat on the back. Are they support columns? No, these are the portico columns. 
Oh, these Paul's are the ones that you're you're, you're sitting on out of the park department. Yeah. Okay. We have pictures of those. Uh, so there are those remnants then also left. They were using some of them for benches at the park at, at one point in time, just scattered around Pioneer Park, lying flat on the ground. Those are, those are, I think those are a different one, though. Different ones. Yeah, these are polished granite. They used to, there were some of them at the zoo, the children's zoo. Okay, right uh, Matt adds that some of these polished granite ones were at the children's zoo. and uh, uh, The other ones were out at Holmes Park, uh, around the clubhouse. That's right, I recall that now. Around the clubhouse at Holmes Park, the golf course clubhouse, there are some of those scattered around. And then there's also one of the limestone capitals from those columns at the Sunken Gardens. It's kind of in the far corner. It's like okay. a seating bench. And a capital of one of the columns in the corner of the Sunken Gardens. That one I did not know about. And then one quick, one more note that there are a number of furnishings that survive from the second building. Okay, and furnishings. These are like tables, chairs, office desks. Uh, a lot of bookcases, a okay. lot of oak bookcases from the court. And bookcase, so those are scattered around in the new building right. someplace, okay. So a fair amount of just little pieces, but not, not any great pieces. Okay, this is the Ballantine edition, or Block 67. Block 67 today we would know as the block which has Lincoln Federal Savings and Loan, Firestone, and St. Paul Methodist Church. That's Block 67. Uh, at one point uh, in time, this block was owned by Jacob Dawson, uh, who owned pieces of round of Lincoln, of course, and when the Capital Commission uh, decided that Lancaster would become Lincoln, this is one of the properties that Jacob and Edith Dawson deeded, at least part of it, uh, to uh, the state of Nebraska. Uh, then lots 10, 11, and 12 were deeded to St. Paul Methodist Church. Um, during the ensuing land auctions, which were held to raise money to build the Capitol building and finance the state of Nebraska, uh, none of the other lots in this particular block sold. However, to give you a reference point, similar lots in adjacent or nearby blocks were going for $50 or $60 at that auction. And we we'll want to keep that in mind. We see what happens to the values of that land very quickly. Uh, in 1860s, early in the 1860s, a man by the name of George W. Ballantyne came from either Missouri or St. Louis, excuse me, or Sioux City, we don't know for sure which because it's reported to coming from both, uh, arrived in Lincoln. And in 1879, he was elected the city treasurer, uh, and he also was a land agent for the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad. He also supposedly owned a hotel called the Hubbard House, which was not much of a hotel, and he lived in the Tishner House Hotel at 13th and K. Uh, by 1881, he'd bought uh, several lots here. He bought lots five and six in this particular block for $800. So, so call them $400 a piece. But he then took those two lots and reconfigured them as A, B, C, D, E along 11th Street, and he called that Valentine's addition to the city of Lincoln. Uh, sadly, uh, the fates did not smile on Mr. Ballantyne, and he lost his undeveloped property, probably for unpaid taxes, and got out of Dodge and moved to Denver. Then the lots were purchased at a sheriff's sale for $30, so they've kind of taken an up and down turn. Uh, along comes a man by the name of Charles Montgomery, who was a real estate broker, and he purchased the two corner lots, that's A and B, and bizarrely, it's listed as him buying them for $14,000. There's got to be something more to that story or just plain an error. I don't know. That was in about 1885. And in 1886, he began construction of a three-story brick building on the corner. It goes up only to the center portion of this building. So the left hand or the northernmost portion of the building. Then in 1872, Lorenzo Billingsley came from Indianapolis. He started a law firm known as Lamb and Billingsley, uh, and in 1887 he was elected to the city council and began construction of the right-hand side of the building. So it's known as the uh, Billingsley-Montgomery block or Billingsley-Montgomery building, a common wall between them. Uh, 1889 there was a grocery store on the ground floor and 16 offices above, including Mr. Montgomery's brokerage business. Uh, Billingsley Half had the Cranser Music Company in it, which survives in a lot of advertising pieces, which we see in, uh, in antique malls today. 
and Billingsley Attorney's Office were up there as well. Then, in 1887, Billingsley was elected to the first city council. Now, you have to define that because it's under a new charter when Lincoln becomes a city of the first class. Uh, and at that point in time, I'm sure he was thinking he would just have a peaceful uh, term as a city councilman, uh, but he became in, engaged in a very interesting legal problem which would take a, a good hour to talk about the whole thing. We'll just say that with the 87 election, uh, it was quite common for new offices, officers to be appointed by the new mayor. So police chief, everybody would be appointed. And there was only one office which carried forward at that time, and that was the police judge. And the police judge had instituted a system of, we'll call them fines, for the um, ladies of the city who were operating a business, not to put too fine a point on it, for prostitution. Okay? And what he did was he set up a series of fees or fines uh, running $10 per house and roughly $5 per employee, if you follow uh, the definitions here. Uh, this sort of allowed them to operate what would be an illegal business by just simply paying off these fees, which he said uh, he did because it did away with time-consuming arrests, court appearances, and unnecessary paperwork. Uh, unfortunately, the fines which he collected, the money never seemed to quite reach the county treasurer. Uh, they seemed to be entering his pocket mostly. Uh, so at that point in time, Mr. Billingsley, uh, on the advice of counsel uh, in the city council, declared the position of police judge vacant. In other words, literally fired him and appointed a replacement. Uh, the former judge was not happy because this was a fine source of income for him. So he acquir uh, acquired what's called a bill in equity from the federal judge in St. Louis, saying that the city council had no authority to fire him. Uh, then a restraining order uh, followed the writ, uh, and it ordered the mayor and the entire city council to appear before the federal judge uh, and answer charges. Uh, again, their attorney said, I would ignore them if I were you, which is never really good advice when you have a federal warning. So they all ended up in jail in Omaha, the mayor of the city of Lincoln and the entire city council. As I said, it's, it's a long story. We'll just quickly snip through it and say that the court, uh, the case ultimately ended up in the U.S. Supreme Court. And when it was decided, the city of Lincoln won the case, saying that the federal court had no jurisdiction over them. And this established the principle of home rule, which is important to every municipality in the United States. Um, by 1966, this building, which was beginning to deteriorate rather badly, it had, over on the left-hand side, all I remember of the building really was the Army and Navy store was in there. Uh, on the upper floor, there was only one business operating. Uh, all of the apartments were empty, and the one business was KZUM Radio, who I think we talked about earlier, tends to follow buildings around on their last legs and ultimately is the last tenant in the building. Uh, so by the early 1970s, this was all gone, and Lincoln Federal Savings had built their new building on this particular property. Now we are at the hotel, uh, which stood uh, at 10th and, excuse me, 9th and Q Streets on the southwest corner of the intersection. Now in Lancaster, this was probably about 5th and College Streets, uh, but with the new plot of the city of Lincoln, it magically becomes 9th and Q Streets. Uh, originally there were two houses which sat on the corner. Uh, today, this is where we have Barry's Bar. I always like to give you a landmark that you all know, okay? Um, early in 1867, that corner had a dance hall on it, uh, and a man lived there whose name was Jennings, and he was on Lincoln's Board of Trustees, which would have been the city council, but, but not called that at that point in time. Uh, he was also one of the original members of the Lancaster County Bar Association, and just to the west of his house was that little house that belonged to Captain Donovan, where the Capitol Commission met in 1867. Uh, and in his attic chose the village of Lancaster to become the first capital of the state of Nebraska. Uh, Donovan, of course, we talked about months and months ago. Uh, and it was his attic that we talked about as well. Okay, now a man by the name of Joseph Opelt 
O-P-E-L-T, or sometimes O apostrophe P-E-L-T. Uh, he came to Brownville, Nebraska in 1855, and he started um, a restaurant and later became the manager of a Brownville hotel called the Union Hotel. Um, and in the 1870s, it was considered the most popular hotel in the state of Nebraska. We don't know much about it. But it did have new and elegant ladies and men's bathrooms. We know that because that was in their advertisement. Then in 1879, he moved to Lincoln, where a man by the name of Atwood uh, had acquired the lots on that corner of the intersection, the southeast lots. Uh, and in 1880, he completed the three-story, $30,000, 110 foot by 110 foot, doesn't look square to me, but uh, Arlington House, uh, which he said could accommodate 150 guests in 70 rooms. It was probably Lincoln's fourth hotel, as we count them. Uh, the Arlington, at the time it was completed, was advertised as the largest hotel in the state of Nebraska, which I have grave suspicions of. But you can put anything in your advertisement you want to. Uh, I'm sure there were a couple in Omaha that would have been larger than this, but nonetheless, that's what he called it. Uh, and at that time, he opened the hotel under the management of Mr. Opelt uh, from Brownville. Um, the building only had a basement under the western third of the building, which becomes interesting in just a second. Uh, originally, where the hotel is built, there had been on the southwest corner of the hotel, there had been a uh, windmill and a well, which supplied one of about a dozen wells, which supplied clear water to the city of Lincoln. And we can see it in some of those very early sort of hand-drawn aerial views of the city of Lincoln. We can see that windmill, and then we, we see it in photographs as well as time progresses. And as the hotel is built, they take over this windmill, and later the windmill is retained, and we look at the Sanborns maps and see that the windmill is kind of in a corner of the building. The well is still there, probably the windmill is gone, but they use it for a fresh water supply, uh, and maybe to fight fires, I don't know, but at any rate, a water supply sort of morphs around that original well. Uh, also, Mr. Opelt, at the same time, opened what's called a Herdic, H-E-R-D-I-C, line, which is kind of a cross between a horse-drawn taxi and a stagecoach. They look like stagecoaches. Uh, and he primarily operated from the depot to the Capitol building uh, to the university and some of the hotels. Uh, he moved briefly out of Lincoln in 1882. Then 1886, he came back. He bought the hotel and changed the name of the hotel from the Atwood House to the Opelt's Hotel. Uh, in April of 1882, one of the more prominent guests stayed in the hotel uh, and was mentioned several times in the newspaper, Oscar Wilde, uh, came to something at the University of Nebraska, um, and he said in the paper that he arrived in knee breeches, slippers, buckles, and a black velvet coat. You can see he would fit right in uh, to the Lincoln hat. <laughs> But he was not impressed with the city of Lincoln. He was not impressed with the university. And he sort of gushed enthusiastically over the University of Nebraska's bulletin board. Other than that, he didn't have much good to say about Lincoln, but he did think that the Arlington House was one of the best hotels he had ever stopped in. So I don't know what they had in there, but he liked it. By the 1890s, the south end of the hotel, it would be to the left in the picture, had been converted to a billiards room. Uh, and in 1891, the hotel was converted into uh, an in-hotel saloon at that end of the building. Uh, 1895, Opelt sold the hotel. He became manager of the Windsor Hotel. The Windsor sits on the site where now we have the 11th and Q parking garage, which if you park on the sixth floor and go to a uh, program at the lead, you will get out of the parking garage in a longer length of time than whatever you saw at the lead took, I think. It's, that's the, you know that parking garage, though, probably. Um, in 1903, uh, Sanborn's map shows that the Arlington, by that time, had electric lights and was still using oil lamps as well, so ever cautious. Uh, 1910, uh, the hotel was closed, uh, and the, bu the building was occupied by a biscuit company. Then in 1915, the building that we know that sits there today was begun as a single-story building, uh, completed by the Big Four Transit Company and the Lincoln Pure Butter Company. And several other butter companies or creameries used the building as well. Uh, and in the meantime, Barry's Bar had established itself south of this building 
1959. Then they moved to the present building, uh, and in 1978, Mr. Berry died. His wife carried on the business, but in 1988 sold it again uh, to Webb and Hamilton. Uh, then, in 2011, uh, the Hamiltons announced that they were going to close that October, and June of 2012, uh, the bar was purchased by a Missouri firm, uh, and restoration of the building began. Uh, at that point, it was 97 years old. Uh, today, if we go to that building, uh, we can go into the westernmost lower level of the building and see something interesting. Now, architects today uh, and contractors love to tell you that you've got to tear down, not only tear down the old building that's there, but they want a clean hole. They want all of that foundation work removed generally. But uh, in, the, in 1915, when the current building was built, it was still common to use part of any foundation wall that still remained. So it's possible that the rubble wall foundation we see in the westernmost corner of the present Berry's Bar was part of the west basement of the Arlington Hotel that we see here. Hard to say, we'll never prove it, uh, but when that building was built 132 years ago at that point in time, Rutherford B. Hayes was president of the United States, Seth Gailey was the mayor of Lincoln, and Lincoln's population was 13,303. So maybe part of that building survives today. It's nice to speculate, but it might not. Uh, the Lincoln Journal, and this building sits right where we think of the Lincoln Journal building sits. Uh, after, in fact, just days after uh, Lincoln was chosen as the capital of the new state of Nebraska in 1867, uh, the Nebraska City Press, the newspaper there, announced that Charles Gere of Pawnee City would be publishing a newspaper in Lincoln as soon as possible. Quote, as soon as possible. Doesn't mean much. Interestingly, Mr. Gere had arrived in Nebraska uh, with his father after his father had lost his entire fortune having invested in a patented printing press, which failed. Uh, at any rate, the same time in 1867, Jacob Dawson, uh, said that he was going to publish a newspaper in Lincoln to be called the Nebraska State Journal. That newspaper did not see the light of day, however. Now, Gear, Charles Gear, the same man for whom the library is named, had been the private secretary to Governor Butler, the first state uh, governor. Um, and he then printed what he called the Nebraska Commonwealth. In 1867, he printed it in Nebraska City, but it was for distribution and circulation in the city of Lincoln. So he carted it up here. Uh, September the 7th in 1867 was that issue number one, volume one, number one. Uh, the second edition uh, wasn't quite exactly a daily at that time. The first one, September the 7th. The second issue comes out November the 2nd. So, you know, a little bit later on, not even a monthly at that point in time. Uh, and he printed it in Lincoln on a used printing press with used type that was about to be thrown away in Nebraska City uh, that he got and he brought up to Lincoln and he published it in an attorney's office uh, over on the northeast corner of 10th and P Streets. Uh, so that's where the first edition of Lincoln was printed. But ultimately, uh, they're going to move uh, again. Uh, Mr. Gear will be considered the editor and Mr. Carter, his partner who came from the Nebraska City Press along with the press and the type, uh, was listed as the publisher, but also as the compositor. So they didn't have very many employees, obviously. Uh, for the third issue, they moved to the Academy of Music building on the south side of O between 10th and 11th. Uh, and then finally, they're going to move to the southwest corner of 9th and O streets, where today we have a two-floor open parking garage. 1869, the Commonwealth will change its name to the Nebraska State Journal. In July of 1870, the Burlington Missouri River Railroad gets to Lincoln, uh, and Gear announces that with the arrival of the railroad, Lincoln has arrived as a metropolitan city, uh, and that they will begin publishing the paper on a daily basis, the Daily State Journal, which was considered just simply an offshoot of the Nebraska State Journal. These names become kind of a blizzard here, so don't try to worry about them. Uh, the following year, he was joined by a man by the name of Hathaway, H.D. Hathaway, who came from Plattsmouth. Uh, and the firm that owned the newspaper was called Gear and Hathaway. Uh, they moved to rooms over Rudolph's grocery store and in 1879, 1880, purchased the site of the old Methodist Protestant female seminary, Cadman House, 
at Woodhouse Hotel on the northeast corner of 9th and P Streets. They raised the old building. Uh, remnants of the seminary building would have been built in it, but mostly had been rebuilt as the hotel. And June of 1880, they built, or they uh, dug the basement for the building that we see there on the corner. Um, they moved the presses and everything up from 9th and O, and this was the only time uh, that I have record of that there was not a paper printed. They lost one day's paper just while they moved the presses up here. Uh, and at that time, 1881, 1882, there were four daily newspapers in the city of Lincoln, the Journal, the Globe, the Democrat, and the News. Uh, as a sideline, Mr. Uh, Gear was noted as having terrible, terrible handwriting. And so he purchased what was called a calligraph, which was sort of a typewriter, uh, one of the first ones certainly in the city. Uh, and he called it, had about an acre of keyboard because every key, either upper or lower case, everything had to have a separate key uh, for each character. And some of the uppercase letters, he said, were so far away, he had to stand on his chair to hit them. Uh, must have been quite a machinery, you don't know. Uh, 1881, the building was dedicated. 1897, a man by the name of Joe Seacrest began buying interest in the paper. Uh, and by 1904, he bought out all of the Hathaway and Gear interests, 1922. It's said he owned virtually the entire paper, although there were tiny, small pieces of it still owned by others. 1931, of course, the Star uh, newspaper and the Journal newspaper will have common advertising departments and a common advertising department, but continue as separate newspapers with separate editorial directions and editors. Uh, here we see with the new building started and the old building left. So they're going to first start with a tiny little part on the east, move into there, then they'll move down to the three and four story building and tear it down, which by this time has literally shaken itself to pieces. Uh, the building had the heavy presses in it, um, and although we're a basement under part of it, uh, my recollection of entering the building was that when you went in the building, the first floor, if you, you would go along a corridor towards the north, and to go into the offices to the right, the first one, you have to step up to get in. And as you go back, you step level and then step down. The building was just literally falling down around itself, tamping itself into the ground with these huge heavy presses. And I said, if you had dropped a marble inside the front door, it would have <laughs> headed off towards the back like that. The building was in terrible shape. So we're going to complete that. Then we're going to tear down the building on the left-hand side, continue that two-story building to the west. Then later on, we'll build to the east, and the building will be complete as it stands today. Um, in 1950, the two newspapers start a third venture called the Journal Star Printing Company. And both separate newspapers will use that as a printing company for their two separate newspapers. In 1951, the Star becomes the morning paper and the journal wisely decides to remain the evening paper. After all, that's the people, or the paper everybody reads. Um, 1995, April Fool's Day, as a matter of fact, Lee Enterprises bought out the Seacrests. Uh, and at the Seacrest, at that point in time, they'd owned the journal for 108 years, and Lee Enterprise was 105 years old. So similar, similar uh, dates on the two newspapers. And ultimately, we will build literally the entire block with the corner uh, for the uh, parking garage and then go across the street to the north and build the Journal Star Printing Company building, which we see there. And I think that is where uh, we will want to leave today. This is the Gulick Bakery, which was on the corner of the Journal building, right directly to the east. And the Gulick's was at 912 P Street. It had been established in 1875 by Peter Gulick, who had come from Germany. Uh, and operated it as a bakery of great success. Uh, at their height, they had 14 bakers and five delivery men. Their two ovens could produce 8,000 loaves of bread a day. They said they used a million pounds of flour a year, and their annual sales were $60,000. And that's a lot of bread at a nickel a, a go. Uh, that, I think, is where we will end for the day because I'm getting the time, time sign, and we didn't get through tray three at all, uh, but we will close here, and we will have time for questions now if you have any, or answers, <laughs> better yet. Any, yes? Are those, are those trees still there? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
still underneath Lincoln? Uh, the question was, are the artesian wells and the streams still under Lincoln? Well, certainly the streams, which we think of them as a gra gravel, dry gravel bed, they're certainly still mostly there. Uh, I think that most of the artesian flows have uh, dried up because if an artesian flow is not you know, doesn't get additional rainwater to charge it, the word I want doesn't come into my mind, uh, they will slowly reduce and, and ultimately dry up. I don't know whether there are any artesian flows other than probably the salt water well, uh, which was under the alley behind the old city hall and the old post office. Uh, that may still flow. We know that there was still flow in there, was it about 10 years ago, something like that? Uh, trickling salt water clear down to the alley between um, the florist shop and the haymarket uh, and Laszlo's, that little area. But I don't know the answer, and I don't know who, how we could tell, but I'm guessing most of them have dried up because they aren't recharged. And with the new buildings taken, the old ones, all those like little tunnels with the arches you spoke of, those are all gone too? The question was whether the little tunnels with the arches are all gone, and the answer to that is no, uh, they're not. In fact, I think they may have filled the one I was speaking of with sand, and it's still there. Matt's father was involved in that. Do you have the answer to that? The one that they filled was under O Street further east, like at 20, what, 24th? Or, no, you're, uh, no, no, I know you're wrong on that one because I've been in it. That, so. that one is not, that is, okay. that is a stream bed. That is Antelope Creek that you're thinking of. Uh, and what she's thinking of is these little arroyos downtown. And, of course, downtown are just crisscrossed with, with gravel beds. And I, I don't know of any that still have water or anything. Well, I think the work that they did on that, the one down on, like, End Street, yeah. They just kind of did some linings. Oh, they did, so they still use it. I don't think they filled it. Okay, Matt them. says he thinks it was lined and it's still used. Uh, and some of them, I think, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's your homework. Ask your father. Uh, other than that, I don't know. Ed, do you know of any that are still there? Uh, you know, it's natural to think that some of them would be filled in before they collapse, because you don't want that to collapse and have this uh, pavement and buildings on top of them going in. Others of them, I think, were probably filled with sand. It could still be there. But at that one, which parallel, it, it ran in the alley between N and O, roughly from uh, 12th to Salt Creek. <coughs> Apparently, that's still there. Now, what we ought to do, we ought to have a, uh, a field trip, and we ought to go down to Salt Creek, because we, we could see where that probably still empties in and see if, it, if we can carry it back. I don't know. Sounds like a bus tour, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> Question? What sort of uh, entertainment was performed at the opera houses? Most of the entertainment that would, would have been would have been plays originally. Uh, like the two orphans. And we have some playbills. Uh, it would be later that they brought in what you and I would think of as vaudeville. And then after that would have come the motion picture. And of course, as the Lansing Theater is built, it's, it so overshadows the funk in size repertory and so forth, that it really causes the end of the opera house in Lincoln. Now, although the Lansing was called an opera house, it soon becomes a vaudeville theater and, and a proper theater. I don't think we've talked about that yet. That's going to be a, a large undertaking. Uh, we won't probably get it next time, but within the next couple of sequences, we'll get that. And then, of course, vaudeville will be supplanted by the motion picture. Now, the motion picture <laughs> kind of supplanting things as well. Uh, there was another question. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we're we're just sort of rambling on now, and this probably isn't going to get recorded. We don't know. But any other questions? If not, we you will have to wait and see. Eileen and I will have to determine next month. Ed Zimmer, that is January, so probably it would be no earlier than February for the next session. Okay, thank you.